are actually starting a new series this week called Act Justly, and I am super excited about it because really over the past several weeks, there's sort of been this conversation that has risen to the surface in our culture that is all about what does it look like to pursue justice here in our country. And even as a church, many of us have gathered around and have started to have conversations about what does it look like for us to pursue justice as a congregation and as individuals? How do we go after this? How do we seek justice for people in our communities, in the world, and in our own lives? But it's important to remember in the midst of this whole conversation that the pursuit of justice or the drive for justice isn't just the reality of this cultural moment. It's not, we're not just talking about this because it's trending right now. The reality is, is the pursuit of justice is a biblical call. It's God's call. And we can hear it and see it uh, come out throughout the entire Old Testament. But then we also see it at the heart of Jesus' ministry. We see it fulfilled in the cross. And we see it fully realized at the point of Christ's return. And so anybody who is a follower of Christ is called to passionately live the pursuit of justice out as they follow Jesus. And really, you can see the call to pursue justice in our theme verse for the entire series, Micah 6, 8. God has shown you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, in our culture, um, when we talk about justice, nine times out of ten, we are talking about uh, rebellion. retributive justice, which is basically a justice where uh, people need to be punished for the things that they have done. And so we oftentimes talk about justice in terms of you've done something wrong, you've committed a crime, and so you go before the jury or the judge, and then you get a punishment for what it is that you've done. Nine times out of ten in our language, in our culture, that's what we're talking about. But the irony is, is that nine times out of ten, the Bible is not talking about retributive justice. It's talking about reparative justice. It's talking about a justice that's advocating for the vulnerable, that's advocating for the oppressed and sort of looking to change or repair the behaviors and systems that perpetuate injustice. And so you can see this theme of justice throughout all of scripture. Now, later in our series, we're going to dig in deeper to this idea of, of reparative and retributive justice and how that all, but, but for today, what we're going to start with is just sort of laying a foundation of where we see justice show up in the biblical story and the foundation of it actually starts on page one. And so if you look at the first page of Genesis and the first couple pages of the books of the Bible, you will begin to see... <clears throat> that this theme shows up, and it shows up in this way, that when God creates humans, he creates them and forms them in his own image. Humans are created in the image of God, and then they're charged with the responsibility of representing God here on earth, of, of making judgments and decisions that are based on the way God defines good and evil by his definition of good and bad. Now, Originally, we have been created to see the image of God in each other, that when we look at a person, what we see is God's image. And so what that wells up inside of us is this desire and this passion to to treat them as the image of God, to treat them with fairness and dignity, no matter who they were. But, but unfortunately... What humans do instead is we redefine good and bad on our own terms. Humans redraw the lines in ways that benefit them and we redraw them so that we are always at the center of good and they over there, others, are always in the bad category. We redraw them in ways that benefit us so that we can ignore the image of God in other human beings. Humans then take advantage of others and they sometimes enslave them for their own personal gain. 
We see it happening between individuals. We see it happening in families. We see it happening in entire communities. And in fact, we even see it happen in entire nations until the world sort of just becomes this big, big jumbled mess of injustice and oppression and bondage. Now, God didn't want to keep the world that way. He had, that was never supposed to be the plan. And so he had a plan from the beginning of how to untangle that mess, of how to set people free from this place of bondage. He had a plan of how to redeem and restore the entire world. And so out of this whole mess of the world, God chose one family. He chose one person. He chose a man named Abraham to start this new kind of family. Specifically, Abraham was supposed to lead his family in a way where they followed the ways of the Lord, where they sought justice and righteousness. That when, as they lived their lives, whenever it was that they saw a people group who was oppressed or enslaved, that Abraham and his family would move to set them free, would move to seek justice and righteousness in the midst of the situation. Now, if you can remember from our story from last week, they don't always do that. <laughs> that didn't always happen. See, generation after generation, they actually treat each other, treated each other unfairly, and they took advantage of one another. And then they even found themselves as immigrant slaves being oppressed unjustly in the country of Egypt. But even still, God didn't want to leave them that way. He heard the cries of the people in their oppression. And God moved to confront the evil of the Egyptians. And he moved to rescue Israel out of this bondage of Egypt and set them free. And just like the Israelites sort of longed to be free, they knew that they weren't meant to be slaves. There is a cry in every one of our hearts that says, I'm not meant to be oppressed. I'm not meant to be enslaved. I long to be free. That's present in all peoples, in all times. There's this longing to be free. We can see it manifested throughout all of history. And we see this longing in the declaration that our country celebrates every 4th of July. A declaration that includes the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, the tragic irony about that statement is that at the same time, people were making this amazing declaration of liberty and freedom. There were people a part of that land that were being enslaved by the color of their skin. And that's really not unique to our narrative. We see that happening throughout history also. See, there's this ongoing tension between the desire for us to have freedom for ourselves and the pursuit of freedom for others. You, you see it in Israel's story. The same Israelites that had been oppressed and enslaved by the Egyptians and had longed for freedom themselves eventually go to oppress and enslave other vulnerable groups of people. It's one of the reasons why God finally leads Israel into exile and says, hey, you, you have to go. You're not representing me. You're not representing the way that I want you to treat the other people in the image of God. See, there's this ongoing cycle throughout history where the oppressed become the oppressors, where the victims of injustice becomes the perpetrators of injustice. And what scripture reminds us of over and over again is that God desires to break this cycle. God desires to end this cycle of injustice and oppression. In fact, the psalmist um, in Psalm 146 says this, the Lord sets the prisoners free. And then when Jesus launches into his own ministry, um, he launches into it with this other declaration of freedom. What he says is that the spirit of the Lord is on me 
because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, that passage that Jesus quotes is actually from um, the book of Isaiah. It's Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. It's part of what we now call the servant of the Lord passages. They're these Old Testament passages um, that, that were used to predict that one day, one day, someone was going to come and make everything right. Someday, someone was going to come and set everyone free. All of those who had been oppressed and enslaved, that that person was going to come and break the bondage of slavery and the chains of oppression. Now, when Jesus read this, this passage that was in Isaiah, it was part of the first sermon that he had ever preached. He was in the middle of this synagogue in Nazareth, which, he, which is the town that he grew up in. Now, typically what would happen when someone would preach a sermon was they would go into the synagogue, they would open the scrolls, they would read the scripture in Hebrew, then they would translate it to Aramaic because most people didn't speak Hebrew at that point. So they'd translate it to Aramaic and then they'd speak like some wise words of reflection about the passage. But what Jesus did when he read this and everyone's expecting him to like wax eloquently about this passage and speak some wise words, what Jesus does does is he gives them this short phrase. He says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, I I am the servant of the Lord who Isaiah predicted would come. I am the one who's going to set the prisoners free. I'm the one that's going to liberate the oppressed. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. And you know how all the people who heard him responded? (laughs) Yes, they loved it. They thought this was the greatest thing that they'd ever heard. They were so excited that Jesus had come. They were so excited that the long-awaited one was here because what they thought was now going to happen was that Jesus was going to set them free from the Romans. They thought that what Jesus was talking about was setting them free from the oppressive Roman government. They loved it because they thought that Jesus was talking about kicking Caesar out of office. They loved it because they thought that Jesus was going to lead a revolt and overthrow the Roman government. They loved it because they thought that Jesus was going to kick the Romans out of Palestine once and for all. They loved it because they had been oppressed by the Romans and they couldn't wait to be set free from them. And they couldn't wait for the Romans to be destroyed. In fact, I bet in some of their minds, they were thinking, we're going to give them a taste of their own medicine. And the cycle would continue. Now, this is a pretty typical response to the message of Jesus. We hear that he has come to set people free. And those who are currently experiencing oppression latch onto that. And they, they receive that message with so much excitement. This is Right. And if you think about it this way, it really is the reason why that as the gospel has been spreading over the, over the, over the whole world for the last 2,000 years, it's oftentimes that the poor have received it before the rich, why women have received it before men, why ethnic, ethnic minorities have tended to accept the gospel before the dominant ethnic culture, no no matter what that dominant ethnic culture is. And that's really for many reasons, but, but one of the reasons throughout history has been that the poor and women and ethnic minorities have been the most marginalized within a culture. And when you are marginalized and disadvantaged, you actually become acutely aware that there's sort of this cap that is held over your head at some point that keeps you from going any further. That at some point, you kind of get stuck in the situation that you're in. That in some ways, you're sort of held in bondage in that situation, and you can go no further. And you know without a doubt that the reason you're stuck there isn't just a result of how hard you've worked 
or the quality of your performance. If you're a man, you can rationalize that everything that you have is the result of your hard work and the quality of your performance. But a woman can, just, can work just as hard and the quality of her performance can be just as good and still she gets paid less than you. And if you were born into a family with financial resources, you can rationalize that everything you have is as the result of your hard work and the quality of your performance. But for somebody who was born into poverty, they can work just as hard as you and perform just as quality of work as you and still not have the same opportunities that you had. And if you're part of an ethnic majority in your culture, you can rationalize that everything you have is as a result of your hard work and and your quality performance. But someone who is part of an ethnic minority can work just as hard and perform just as quality of work. They can be um, quality of their performance uh, just as food. They simply may not benefit from the same context or the same network, or the same advantages that you benefit from. And that's true whether their minority status status is because of the color of their skin, or the tribe that they are a part of, or the religion that they adhere to. So for some, so for those who have been marginalized, a salvation and a freedom that's based on grace and not performance is an amazing and a welcome news because you've tried everything that you could to work hard on your own to get ahead. But the bondage that your marginalized position is something that you can't change in and of yourself. It's something that you can't earn your way out of. And so someone coming in and setting you free and saying that they will give you a freedom that's based on grace and liberation and not your performance just makes sense because you know that life is way more complex than just getting what you've earned and what you've deserved. You can't reduce it down to just that. And so when Jesus talks about freedom for those who are enslaved and oppressed, it makes those who have experienced oppression and and, and, and enslavement overjoyed. And they're eager to accept Jesus' message, just like the worshipers who were in the synagogue on that day. And even today, we really do understand that Jesus wants to save oppressed people. But if you're on the other side of that, If you think that life is primarily about what you have done, what you have earned, and the quality of your performance, then it becomes a little bit harder to accept that you need to be freed from anything. Your perception has taught you that everything is really achievable through performance and work. So so when Jesus starts to talk about being the one who sets all of the people free from bondage, it's harder to accept the idea that he's talking about you, that he's talking about us. It's harder to accept the idea that you need to be saved because in your mind, you're fine. And if there is anything wrong, I can probably work hard enough to get myself out of it, to make it right. So Jesus wants to make sure in that moment that all of the worshipers understand that the salvation and the freedom that he was bringing is so much bigger than being just for those who are on the margins of society and those who are oppressed. Jesus wanted to remind all of the people that it isn't just economic or political oppression that he has come to change. He wants to show all of the people that he actually came to liberate everyone who's oppressed in any way, even those in positions of power that didn't realize that they too are enslaved and needed to be set free. Because it's only when those who have been oppressed and those who are the oppressor have been set free that this cycle of oppression and enslavement is 
broken. And ultimately, that's what God wants to do. And so Jesus, in the middle of this synagogue of people who are so excited that he's the one who has come to set them free, to liberate them from the oppressive Roman government, Jesus begins to talk about two stories. He begins to tell stories of two people that were from the Old Testament, that were set free from two very different things. First, he talks about this widow, the widow of Zavarth. She was poor, she was a Gentile, she was an idol worshiper who God miraculously provides food for in the midst of a famine. Second, Jesus brings up this other guy, Naaman the Assyrian. He was rich, he was a Gentile, he was an idol worshiper, and he actually murdered and enslaved a ton of Israelite people. But God had miraculously healed him. Both of them were sort of these members of groups that had oppressed Israel, but God rescued them both. God set them both free. God set free the very people who had enslaved Israel. And see, when Jesus said that he had been sent to release the oppressed, He wasn't just talking about the people who knew that they were oppressed. He was talking about everyone. He was talking about the Romans who needed to be set free from their abusive use of power. He was talking about the religious Jews who were so focused on being set free from the Roman oppression that they had sort of turned this blind eye to the fact that they needed to be set free from their own judgmentalism that sort of divided the whole world in their own categories of good and bad and always sort of put them on the good side and everyone else on the bad side. They were so convinced that they had it right that when Jesus reminds them that God is more concerned about setting them free of the oppression of their own judgmentalism than setting them free from the Roman government, the whole crowd got mad. That synagogue who was cheering them on saying, you got it, Jesus. Yeah, we're going to take the Romans. They then get mad at Jesus because he starts pointing a finger at them that they also need to be liberated, that the Romans have to be liberated. They get so mad that they take Jesus, they kick him out of town and try to push him off a cliff to kill him. They didn't like that version of setting people free. See, all of us need to be set free from something. And sometimes, just like the people in the synagogue, the freedom that Jesus is offering is really not what we had imagined. That's not what we think. Sometimes we're enslaved by something we didn't even realize that we were enslaved by. And when Jesus comes along and he reminds them of of what they're enslaved by, sometimes when Jesus brings us face to face with the facts that we aren't as good as we thought we were, we oftentimes push back. We think, how dare you challenge my goodness? And we, just like the people in the synagogue, we want to throw the messenger off the cliff. So the question I have for you today is really where does Jesus need to set you free? Maybe you need to be set free from some power or some resources or some advantages that you have in culture that you aren't stewarding well. You're sort of using whatever power or resources you have primarily to advance yourself and not others because you think that you somehow deserve it. Or maybe you need to be set free from sort of dividing the world into two camps that are based on your own definitions of good and bad and not God's. You have the good people camp and and the bad people camp. And then you always put yourself in the good people camp and think that God's ultimate mission is to save the good people from the bad people. Instead of actually realizing that 
in reality, there's really only one camp because we have all been made in the image of God. And God wants to save all of the people, to set us all free because we are all his children. That God's ultimate mission is to not set us free from the darkness that's out there, but the darkness that's in here. Or maybe for you, you need to be set free from the idea that somehow you can save yourself, that you don't really need to be rescued, that there's really just nothing wrong, that you don't need to be set free from your sin, that you don't need to be set free from your past. Or maybe it's something else. But whatever it is that you need to be set free from, Jesus wants to set you free. That's why he came. But the reality is, is that you will never be set free until you repent and admit that there's something that you need to be set free from. We can't just walk into freedom without allowing Jesus to change the thing inside of us, without allowing Jesus to speak to us and bring us face to face from the thing that has enslaved us. You know, this year, I, I love to garden, and this year we, we sort of extended our garden to a new section. We started a whole new thing, and I was super excited about it because I knew all of the plants that I was going to put in this part of the garden. And so what we did was we brought in all of the wood chips and the mulch, and we laid them on top of the grass that had been growing previously, and then we started planting all the things. Now... Two months later, all the grass that was still underneath the surface has just popped through the wood chips. It's popped through the ground cover and is now this weedy, disgusting mess. And I think what God wants to do in our hearts is he says, I don't want to have to keep pulling weeds in your life. What I really want to do is I want to uproot all of the stuff that's happening under the surface. I want to uproot all of that stuff that you're enslaved from so that when I plant something new in you to take root and grow, that there aren't all these weeds coming up out of nowhere, that you're not perpetually having to deal with all of this garbage that's coming up in your life. And so what Jesus wants to do today is he wants to bring you to a place where he can root that out, where he can set you free. So as you move forward, as you walk into what Christ has called you to, you can truly be free. And so I'm going to close us in prayer, but, but what I would love for you to do as we pray is for you to also have a conversation with God where, where you, maybe you know what the thing is that has held you in bondage. And you talk to God about that and you say, God, I see it. <laughs> I maybe have been denying it for a really long time, but I see it. I see how there is this weed, this thing that has taken root in me and I want you to uproot it. I want you to set me free. Maybe there's others of you who are like, yeah, I, I don't know what the thing is. I, I, don't, I don't know what the thing is. And so during our prayer, what I'm going to ask you to do is to talk to God about that. To say, God, I, I don't know what it is, but would you reveal it to me? Would you give me eyes to see the ways that I, even though I feel not oppressed, am actually in bondage? Let's pray together. Father God, we know that your great love has come to set us free. But we see these cycles of bondage and oppression in, 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 our, in our world. And so Father God, this morning we'd like you to show them in the ways that they have taken root in our own lives. 
we ask that you would reveal them to us so you might root them out. Would you take them and remove them? Would you set us free that we might be liberated people who could then pursue a new way to live, to pursue heaven on earth, to see others made in the image of God, that we would surrender all of the ways that we've divided what is good and what is bad over to you, that you would now be the one who defines good and bad. Father, would you make us and remake us into a people that truly do represent who you were, who Jesus came to earth to be, to proclaim and demonstrate that the prisoners have been set free. That you are a God who is so much bigger than bondage. And so, Father, would you begin to work in our hearts? Would you show us, would you reveal in our eyes the ways that we can begin to walk in this truth that, that, that you are the Son who has set us free? We pray all of these things in your holy and your precious name. Amen. Guys, we wanted to take a minute to do... Um, some questions and answers, and I know some of you have um, submitted some questions, and so we're going to take a look at those now. Um, and again, if you have a question that you would like to submit, it's not too late. You can put it in the comment section if you're watching on Facebook, or you can text any question to the number 240-454-5353. All right, let's go ahead and see what you guys are all thinking about. Um, here's the first one. Um, can't we just let all of the social justice stuff work itself out and just focus on the gospel? Actually, this is a great question because it is one that I've seen pop up um, amongst a lot of uh, churches in particular of trying to wrestle through this idea of can't we just can't we just engage in the relationship? Can't we just tell people about who Jesus is? And we're just, we're just going to, because really how much power do we have in changing justice and social justice and, and advocating for people? And um, I would say that that's a great idea to just focus on the relationship uh, and sharing Jesus with other people. The problem is, is that's not consistent with Scripture, um, like we've looked at now, what we see throughout scripture is that part of who Jesus is, like the essence of his being, the heart of his ministry is really about engaging in justice, right? One of the ways that we talk about it here at Clarksburg Church is this idea that as Christians, we are called to both proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom of God, the universal rule and reign of God here on earth. And, um, proclamation, what you're talking about, focusing on the gospel, which is typically what most people are talking about, the proclamation of, of Jesus as king and Lord and as savior is super important. We can't let that go. We can't let that go. Absolutely not. Um, but what we see Jesus do is that he both proclaimed and demonstrated. And so if we're telling people, hey, Jesus has set you free, but I'm going to enslave you, which is actually what early slave owners did, they would, they actually, what they did was they separated uh, the concept of a body and soul. Whereas in all of the early church and in um, the early church and in the Old Testament and Jewish culture, the body and the soul were united. There was no way to sort of say, oh, it's, they're separate things. No, 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 they were, they were always together. But what happened sort of at the, at the, at the enlightenment is really when it came up, but then was propagated during the time of slavery was this whole idea um, that the body and soul are separate so we can enslave the body, but still teach slaves about who Christ is and say, you are free, but only your soul, you're still enslaved. Now, when we look back at that through history, we're like, shoot, that's really problematic. Like, there's a big issue with that. In fact, the Virginia legislator actually passed a law during the time of slavery, passed a law to say, okay, yes, uh, we want to make sure you tell your slaves about Jesus, so we'll create a law that says that they're, that they're distinct, that the body and soul are distinct. Um, I feel like I'm going on this really big tangent, but it seems important to me. Um, and so this is kind of how we get into these situations. And really, as the church, we need to be very aware that the body and soul should never be separated in terms of our theology and how we understand things. Because then what we get is, I'll treat the image of God in your soul, but not your body. And 
God created us with body and soul united. They're, they're intertwined, they're connected. Um, and, so, uh, and, and so the idea of sort of only proclaiming but not demonstrating is really problematic as we begin to read scripture and engage with, with it holistically. Um, that's a great question. Um, there's another one here. It says, um, I'm having a really hard time knowing I'm, really, I'm having a really hard time knowing that I need, what I need to be saved from. I want to be saved if I need to be, but I can't see it. That, yes, um, I think that in our culture, the more, the more opportunity and cultural freedoms you have, it can often be difficult to see the ways that you are enslaved. Um, that can be a challenge because culturally, it seems like economically and politically and socially, you're free. <laughs> but I think that that requires us to take a look a little bit more. Um, one, one thing could be just to pray about it and ask God to reveal what is it that I am being enslaved by? What is it? Because I feel really free. The, the other thought is also um, one of the things that enslaves us is our desire to use our freedom for our own freedom. And so we become a slave to our freedom, really. And the only way to be completely set free for the cycle of oppression, the oppressor, the op oppressed, become the oppressor, is actually for everyone to experience freedom. And so it could be that you're enslaved to your own comfort. It could be that you're enslaved to your own uh, pursuit of freedom, your own um, economic freedom rather than, and so you become a slave to those things rather than using that freedom that you've been given to help proclaim and demonstrate freedom to others. Uh, another really great question. Guys, I love that we have a place that we can wrestle through all of these things together and we can wrestle through these questions um, because the reality is, is following Jesus is, is never black and white. Jesus leads us to all of these different pieces. I mean, even in the story, we see something as simple as I've set the prisoners free to be turned around and Jesus starts talking about people that were the oppressors and he's come to set them free also. And so I'd love that as a community, we can continue to wrestle with and dialogue about these things together.